By the My Thumbs By Agatha Christie Audiobook 5x14 The house door was open and Tuppence went in to say goodbye to MRS. Perry, Perry. MRS. Perry was in the kitchen, washing up the tea things and Tuppence almost automatically pulled a tea cloth off the rack and started drying. Thank you so much, she said, both you and your husband. You've been so kind and hospitable. What's that? From the wall of the kitchen, or rather behind the wall where an old-fashioned range had once stood, there came a loud screaming and squawking and a scratching noise too. That'll be a jackdaw, said MRS. Perry, drop down the chimney in the other house. They do this time of the year. One came down our chimney last week. They make nests in the chimneys, you know. What in the other house? Yes, there it is again. Again the squawking and crying of a distressed bird came to their ears. MRS. Perry said, there's no one to bother, you see, in the empty house. The chimneys ought to be swept and all that. The squawking scratching noises went on. Poor bird, said Tuppence. I know. It won't be able to get up again you mean it'll just die there. Oh yes. One came down our chimney as I say. Two of them, actually. One was a young bird. It was all right, we put it out and it flew away. The other one was dead. The frenzied scuffling and squeaking went on. Oh, said Tuppence, I wish we could get at it. Mr. Perry came in through the door. Anything the matter, he said, looking from one to the other. There's a bird, Amos. It must be in the drawing room chimney next door. Hear it. Eh, it's come down from the jackdaw's nest. I wish we could get in there, said MRS. Perry. Ah, you can't do anything. They'll die from the fright, if nothing else. Then it'll smell, said MRS. Perry. You won't smell anything in here. You're soft-hearted, he went on, looking from one to the other, like all females. We'll get it if you like. Why, is one of the windows open? We can get in through the door. What door? Outside here in the yard. The key's hanging up among those. He went outside and along to the end, opening a small door there. It was a kind of potting shed really, but a door from it led into the other house and near the door of the potting shed were six or seven rusty keys hanging on a nail. This one fits, said Mr. Perry. He took down the key and put it in the door, and after exerting a good deal of cajolery and force, the key turned rustily in the lock. I went in once before, he said, when I heard water running. Somebody d forgotten to shut the water off properly. He went in and the two women followed him. The door led into a small room which still contained various flower vases on a shelf and a sink with a tap. A flower room, I shouldn't wonder, he said. Where people used to do the flowers. See? A lot of the vases left here. There was a door out of the flower room. This was not even locked. He opened it and they went through. It was like, Tuppence thought going through into another world. The passageway outside was covered with a pile carpet. A little way along there was a door half open and from there the sounds of a bird in distress were coming. Perry pushed the door open and his wife and Tuppence went in. The windows were shuttered but one side of a shutter was hanging loose and light came in. Although it was dim, there was a faded but beautiful carpet on the floor, a deep sage green in color. There was a bookshelf against the wall but no chairs or tables. The furniture had been removed no doubt, the curtains and carpets had been left as fittings to be passed on to the next tenant. MRS. Perry went towards the fireplace. A bird lay in the grate scuffling and uttering loud squawking sounds of distress. 
she stooped, picked it up, and said, Open the window if you can, Amos. Amos went over, pulled the shutter aside, unfastened the other side of it and then pushed at the latch of the window. He raised the lower sash which came gratingly. As soon as it was open MRS. Perry leaned out and released the jackdaw. It flopped onto the lawn, hopped a few paces. Better kill it, said Perry. It's damaged. Leave it a bit, said his wife. You never know. They recover very quickly, birds. It's fright that makes them so paralyzed looking. Sure enough, a few moments later the jackdaw, with a final struggle, a squawk, a flapping of wings flew off. I only hope, said Alice Perry, that it doesn't come down that chimney again. Contrary things, birds. Don't know what's good for them. Get into a room, they can never get out of it by themselves. Oh, she added, what a mess. She, Tuppence and Mr. Perry all stared at the grate. From the chimney had come down a mass of soot, of odd rubble and of broken bricks. Evidently it had been in a bad state of repair for some time. Somebody ought to come and live here, said M.R.S. Perry, looking round her. Somebody ought to look after it, Tuppence agreed with her. Some builder ought to look at it or do something about it or the whole house will come down soon. Probably water has been coming through the roof in the top rooms. Yes, look at the ceiling up there, it's come through. Oh, what a shame, said Tuppence, to ruin a beautiful house it really is a beautiful room, isn't it? She and M.R.S. Perry looked together round it appreciatively. Built in 1790 it had all the graciousness of a house of that period. It had had originally a pattern of willow leaves on the discolored paper. It's a ruin now, said M.R. Perry. Tuppence poked the debris in the grate. One ought to sweep it up, said M.R.S. Perry. Now what do you want to bother yourself with a house that doesn't belong to you, said her husband. Leave it alone, woman. It'll be in just as bad a state tomorrow morning. Tuppence stirred the bricks aside with a toe. Ooh, she said with an exclamation of disgust. There were two dead birds lying in the fireplace. By the look of them they had been dead for some time. That's the nest that came down a good few weeks ago. It's a wonder it doesn't smell more than it does, said Perry. What's this thing? said Tuppence. She poked with her toe at something lying half hidden in the rubble. Then she bent and picked it up. Don't you touch a dead bird, said M.R.S. Perry. It's not a bird, said Tuppence. Something else must have come down the chimney. Well I never, she added, staring at it. It's a doll. It's a child's doll. They looked down at it. Ragged, torn, its clothes in rags, its head lolling from the shoulders, it had originally been a child's doll. One glass eye dropped out. Tuppence stood holding it. I wonder, she said, I wonder how a child's doll ever got up a chimney. Extraordinary. Chapter 8 Sudden Chancellor After leaving the canal house, Tuppence drove slowly on along the narrow winding road which she had been assured would lead her to the village of Sutton Chancellor. It was an isolated road. There were no houses to be seen from it only field gates from which muddy tracks led inwards. There was little traffic one tractor came along, and one lorry proudly announcing that it carried Mother's Delight and the picture of an enormous and unnatural looking loaf. The church steeple she had noticed in the distance seemed to have disappeared entirely but it finally reappeared quite near at hand after the lane had bent suddenly and sharply round a belt of trees. Tuppence glanced at the speedometer and saw she had come two miles since the canal house. It was an attractive old church standing in a sizable churchyard with a lone yew tree standing by the church door. Tuppence left the car outside the LYCH gate 
passed through it, and stood for a few moments surveying the church and the churchyard round it. Then she went to the church door with its rounded Norman arch and lifted the heavy handle. It was unlocked and she went inside. The inside was unattractive. The church was an old one, undoubtedly, but it had had a zealous wash and brush up in Victorian times. Its pitch pine pews and its flaring red and blue glass windows had ruined any antique charm it had once possessed. A middle-aged woman in a tweed coat and skirt was arranging flowers in brass vases round the pulpit she had already finished the altar. She looked round at Tuppence with a sharply inquiring glance. Tuppence wandered up an aisle looking at memorial tablets on the walls. A family called Warrender seemed to be most fully represented in early years. All of the Priory, Sutton Chancellor. Captain Warrender, Major Warrender, Sarah Elizabeth Warrender, dearly beloved wife of George Warrender. A newer tablet recorded the death of Julia Stark, another beloved wife, of Philip Stark, also of the Priory, Sutton Chancellor so it would seem the Warrenders had died out. None of them were particularly suggestive or interesting. Tuppence passed out of the church again and walked round it on the outside. The outside, Tuppence thought, was much more attractive than the inside. Early perp. And December, said Tuppence to herself, having been brought up on familiar terms with ecclesiastical architecture. She was not particularly fond of early perp. Herself. It was a fair-sized church and she thought that the village of Sutton Chancellor must once have been a rather more important centre of rural life than it was now. She left the car where it was and walked on to the village. It had a village shop and a post office and about a dozen small houses or cottages. One or two of them were thatched but the others were rather plain and unattractive. There were six council houses at the end of the village street looking slightly self-conscious. A brass plate on a door announced. Arthur Thomas, Chimney Sweep. Tuppence wondered if any responsible house agents were likely to engage his services for the house by the canal which certainly needed them. How silly she had been, she thought, not to have asked the name of the house. She walked back slowly towards the church, and her car, pausing to examine the churchyard more closely. She liked the churchyard. There were very few new burials in it. Most of the stones commemorated Victorian burials, and earlier ones half defaced by lichen and time. The old stones were attractive. Some of them were upright slabs with cherubs on the tops, with wreaths round them. She wandered about, looking at the inscriptions. Warrenders again. Mary Warrender, aged 47, Alice Warrender, aged 33, Colonel John Warrender killed in Afghanistan. Various infant Warrenders deeply regretted and eloquent verses of pious hopes. She wondered if any Warrenders lived here still. They'd left off being buried here apparently. She couldn't find any tombstones later than 1843. Rounding the big yew tree she came upon an elderly clergyman who was stooping over a row of old tombstones near a wall behind the church. He straightened up and turned round as Tuppence approached. Good afternoon, he said pleasantly. Good afternoon, said Tuppence, and added, I've been looking at the church. Ruined by Victorian renovation, said the clergyman. He had a pleasant voice and a nice smile. He looked about seventy, but Tuppence presumed he was not quite as far advanced in age as that, though he was certainly rheumatic and rather unsteady on his legs. Too much money about in Victorian times, he said sadly. Too many iron masters. They were pious, but had, unfortunately, no sense of the artistic. No taste. Did you see the east window, he shuddered. Yes, said Tuppence. Dreadful, she said. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm the vicar, he added, rather unnecessarily. I thought you must be, said Tuppence politely. Have you been here long, 
she added. Ten years, my dear, he said. It's a nice parish. Nice people, what there are of them. I've been very happy here. They don't like my sermons very much, he added sadly. I do the best I can, but of course I can't pretend to be really modern. Sit down, he added hospitably, waving to a nearby tombstone. Tuppence sat down gratefully and the vicar took a seat on another one nearby. I can't stand very long, he said, apologetically. He added, can I do anything for you or are you just passing by? Well, I'm really just passing by, said Tuppence. I thought I'd just look at the church. I'd rather lost myself in a car wandering around the lanes. Yes, yes. Very difficult to find one's way about round here. A lot of signposts are broken, you know, and the council don't repair them as they should. He added, I don't know that it matters very much. People who drive down these lanes aren't usually trying to get anywhere in particular. People who are keep to the main roads. Dreadful, he added again. Especially the new motorway. At least, I think so. The noise and the speed and the reckless driving. Oh well. Pay no attention to me. I'm a crusty old fellow. You'd never guess what I'm doing here, he went on. I saw you were examining some of the gravestones, said Tuppence. Has there been any vandalism? Have teenagers been breaking bits off them? No. One's mind does turn that way nowadays what with so many telephone boxes wrecked and all those other things that these young vandals do. Poor children, they don't know any better, I suppose. Can't think of anything more amusing to do than to smash things. Sad, isn't it? Very sad. No, he said, there's been no damage of that kind here. The boys round here are a nice lot on the whole. No, I'm just looking for a child's grave. Tuppence stirred on her tombstone. A child's grave, she said. Yes. Somebody wrote to me. A Major Waters. He asked if by any possibility a child had been buried here. I looked it up in the parish register, of course, but there was no record of any such name. All the same, I came out here and looked round the stones. I thought, you know, that perhaps whoever wrote might have got hold of some wrong name, or that there had been a mistake. What was the Christian name? asked Tuppence. He didn't know. Perhaps Julia after the mother. How old was the child? Again he wasn't sure. Rather vague, the whole thing. I think myself that the man must have got hold of the wrong village altogether. I never remember a Waters living here or having heard of one. What about the Warrenders? asked Tuppence, her mind going back to the names in the church. The church seems full of tablets to them and their names are on lots of gravestones out here. Ah, that family's died out by now. They had a fine property, an old 14th century priory. It was burnt down oh, nearly a hundred years ago now, so I suppose any warrenders there were left, were away and didn't come back. A new house was built on the site, by a rich Victorian called Stark. A very ugly house but comfortable, they say. Very comfortable. Bathrooms, you know, and all that. I suppose that sort of thing is important. It seems a very odd thing, said Tuppence, that someone should write and ask you about a child's grave. Somebody a relation. The father of the child, said the vicar. One of these war tragedies, I imagine. A marriage that broke up when the husband was on service abroad. The young wife ran away with another man while the husband was serving abroad. There was a child, a child he'd never seen. She'd be grown up by now, I suppose, if she were alive. It must be twenty years ago or more. 
isn't it a long time after to be looking for her? Apparently he only heard there was a child quite recently. The information came to him by pure chance. Curious story, the whole thing. What made him think that the child had been buried here? I gather somebody who had come across his wife in wartime had told him that his wife had said she was living at Sutton Chancellor. It happens, you know. You meet someone, a friend or acquaintance you haven't seen for years, and they sometimes can give you news from the past that you wouldn't get in any other way. But she's certainly not living here now. Nobody of that name has lived here not since I've been here. Or in the neighborhood as far as I know. Of course, the mother might have been going by another name. However, I gather the father is employing solicitors and inquiry agents and all that sort of thing, and they will probably be able to get results in the end. It will take time. Was it your poor child, murmured Tuppence. I beg your pardon, my dear. Nothing, said Tuppence. Something somebody said to me the other day. Was it your poor child? It's rather a startling thing to hear suddenly. But I don't really think the old lady who said it knew what she was talking about. I know. I know. I'm often the same. I say things and I don't really know what I mean by them. Most vexing. I expect you know everything about the people who live here now, said Tuppence. Well, there certainly aren't very many to know. Yes. Why? Is there someone you wanted to know about? I wondered if there had ever been a MRS. Lancaster living here. Lancaster. No, I don't think I recollect that name. And there's a house I was driving today rather aimlessly not minding particularly where I went, just following lanes, I know. Very nice, the lanes round here. And you can find quite rare specimens. Botanical, I mean. In the hedges here. Nobody ever picks flowers in these hedges. We never get any tourists round here or that sort of thing. Yes, I've found some very rare specimens sometimes. Dusty Crane's Bell, for instance, there was a house by a canal, said Tuppence, refusing to be sidetracked into botany. Near a little humpbacked bridge. It was about two miles from here. I wondered what its name was. Let me see. Canal Humpbacked Bridge. Well. There are several houses like that. There's Maricot Farm. It wasn't a farm. Ah, now, I expect it was the Perry's house Amos and Alice Perry. That's right, said Tuppence. AMR. An MRS. Perry. She's a striking looking woman, isn't she? Interesting, I always think. Very interesting. Medieval face, didn't you think so? She's going to play the witch in our play we're getting up. The school children, you know. She looks rather like a witch, doesn't she? Yes, said Tuppence. A friendly witch. As you say, my dear, absolutely rightly. Yes, a friendly witch. But he, yes, poor fellow, said the vicar. Not completely compassmentous but no harm in him. They were very nice. They asked me in for a cup of tea, said Tuppence. But what I wanted to know was the name of the house. I forgot to ask them. They're only living in half of it, aren't they? Yes, yes. In what used to be the old kitchen quarters. They call it Waterside, I think, though I believe the ancient name for it was Watermead. A pleasanter name, I think. Who does the other part of the house belong to? Well, the whole house used to belong originally to the Bradleys. That was a good many years ago. Yes, thirty or forty at least, I should think. And then it was sold, and then sold again and then it remained empty for a long time. 
when I came here it was just being used as a kind of weekend place. By some actress Miss Margrave, I believe. She was not here very much. Just used to come down from time to time. I never knew her. She never came to church. I saw her in the distance sometimes. A beautiful creature. A very beautiful creature. Who does it actually belong to now? Tuppence persisted. I've no idea. Possibly it still belongs to her. The part the Perrys live in is only rented to them. I recognized it, you know, said Tuppence, as soon as I saw it, because I've got a picture of it. Oh really? That must have been one of Boscombe's, or was his name Boscabel I can't remember now. Some name like that. He was a Cornishman, fairly well-known artist, I believe. I rather imagine he's dead now. Yes, he used to come down here fairly often. He used to sketch all round this part of the world. He did some oils here, too. Very attractive landscapes, some of them. This particular picture, said Tuppence, was given to an old aunt of mine who died about a month ago. It was given to her by a MRS. Lancaster. That's why I asked if you knew the name. But the vicar shook his head once more. Lancaster. Lancaster. No, I don't seem to remember the name. Ah. But here's the person you must ask. Our dear Miss Bly. Very active, Miss Bly is. She knows all about the parish. She runs everything. The Women's Institute, the Boy Scouts and the Guides everything. You ask her. She's very active, very active indeed. The vicar sighed. The activity of Miss Bly seemed to worry him. Nellie Bly, they call her in the village. The boys sing it after her sometimes. Nellie Bly, Nellie Bly. It's not her proper name. That's something more like Gertrude or Geraldine. Miss Bly, who was the tweed-clad woman Tuppence had seen in the church, was approaching them at a rapid trot, still holding a small watering can. She eyed Tuppence with deep curiosity as she approached, increasing her pace and starting a conversation before she reached them. Finished my job, she exclaimed merrily. Had a bit of a rush today. Oh yes had a bit of a rush. Of course, as you know, Vicar, I usually do the church in the morning. But today we had the emergency meeting in the parish rooms and really you wouldn't believe the time it took. So much argument, you know. I really think sometimes people object to things just for the fun of doing so. MRS. Hardington was particularly irritating. Wanting everything fully discussed, you know, and wondering whether we'd got enough different prices from different sources. I mean, the whole thing is such a small cost anyway, that really a few shillings here or there can't make much difference. And Buchanheads have always been most reliable. I don't think really, Vicar, you know, that you ought to sit on that tombstone. Irreverent, perhaps, suggested the Vicar. Oh no, no, of course I didn't mean that at all, Vicar. I meant the stone, you know, the damp does come through and with your rheumatism her eyes slid sideways to Tuppence questioningly. Let me introduce you to Miss Bly, said the Vicar. This is this is he hesitated. M.R.S. Beresford, said Tuppence. Ah yes, said Miss Bly. I saw you in the church, didn't I, just now, looking round it. I would have come and spoken to you, called your attention to one or two interesting points, but I was in such a hurry to finish my job. I ought to have come and helped you, said Tuppence, in her sweetest voice. But it wouldn't have been much use, would it, because I could see you knew so exactly where every flower ought to go. Well now. It's very nice of you to say so, but it's quite true. 
I've done the flowers in the church for oh, I don't know how many years it is. We let the school children arrange their own particular pots of wild flowers for festivals, though of course they haven't the least idea, poor little things. I do think a little instruction, but MRS. Peak will never have any instruction. She's so particular. She says it spoils their initiative. Are you staying down here? She asked Tuppence. I was going on to market basing, said Tuppence. Perhaps you can tell me a nice quiet hotel to stay there. Well, I expect you'll find it a little disappointing. It's just a market town, you know. It doesn't cater at all for the motoring trade. The Blue Dragon is a two-star but really I don't think these stars mean anything at all sometimes. I think you'd find the lamb better. Quieter, you know. Are you staying there for long? Oh no, said Tuppence, just a day or two while I'm looking round the neighborhood. Not very much to see, I'm afraid. No interesting antiquities or anything like that. We're purely a rural and agricultural district, said the vicar. But peaceful, you know, very peaceful. As I told you, some interesting wild flowers. Ah yes, said Tuppence, I've heard that and I'm anxious to collect a few specimens in the intervals of doing a little mild house hunting, she added. Oh dear, how interesting, said Miss Bly. Are you thinking of settling in this neighborhood? Well, my husband and I haven't decided very definitely on any one neighborhood in particular, said Tuppence. And we're in no hurry. He won't be retiring for another eighteen months. But it's always as well, I think, to look about. Personally, what I prefer to do is to stay in one neighborhood for four or five days, get a list of likely small properties and drive about to see them. Coming down for one day from London to see one particular house is very tiring, I find. Oh yes, you've got your car here, have you? Yes, said Tuppence. I shall have to go to a house agent in Market Basing tomorrow morning. There's nowhere, I suppose, to stay in the village here, is there? Of course, there's MRS. Copley, said Miss Bly. She takes people in the summer, you know. Summer visitors. She's beautifully clean. All her rooms are. Of course, she only does bed and breakfast and perhaps a light meal in the evening. But I don't think she takes anyone in much before August or July at the earliest. Perhaps I could go and see her and find out, said Tuppence. She's a very worthy woman, said the vicar. Her tongue wags a good deal, he added. She never stops talking, not for one single minute. A lot of gossip and chattering is always going on in these small villages, said Miss Bly. I think it would be a very good idea if I helped MRS. Barris Ford. I could take her along to MRS. Copley and just see what chances there are. That would be very kind of you, said Tuppence. Then we'll be off, said Miss Bly briskly. Goodbye, Vicar. Still on your quest? A sad task and so unlikely to meet with success. I really think it was a most unreasonable request to make. Tuppence said goodbye to the vicar and said she would be glad to help him if she could. I could easily spend an hour or two looking at the various gravestones. I've got very good eyesight for my age. It's just the name Waters you are looking for. Not really, said the vicar. It's the age that matters, I think. A child of perhaps seven, it would be. A girl. Major Waters thinks that his wife might have changed her name and that probably the child might be known by the name she had taken. And as he doesn't know what that name is, it makes it all very difficult. The whole thing's impossible, so far as I can see, said Miss Bly. You ought never to have said you would do such a thing, vicar. It's monstrous, 
suggesting anything of the kind. The poor fellow seems very upset, said the vicar. A sad history altogether, so far as I can make out. But I mustn't keep you. Tuppence thought to herself as she was shepherded by Miss Bly that no matter what the reputation of MRS. Co. Ply for talking, she could hardly talk more than Miss Bly did. A stream of pronouncements both rapid and dictatorial poured from her lips. MRS. Co. Ply's cottage proved to be a pleasant and roomy one set back from the village street with a neat garden of flowers in front, a widened doorstep and a brass handle well polished. MRS. Co. Ply herself seemed to tuppence like a character straight out of the pages of Dickens. She was very small and very round, so that she came rolling towards you rather like a rubber ball. She had bright twinkling eyes, blonde hair rolled up in sausage curls on her head and an air of tremendous vigor. After displaying a little doubt to begin with well, I don't usually, you know. No. My husband and I say summer visitors, that's different. Everyone does that if they can nowadays. And have to, I'm sure. But not this time of year so much, we don't. Not until July. However, if it's just for a few days and the lady wouldn't mind things being a bit rough, perhaps, Tuppence said she didn't mind things being rough and MRS. Coply having surveyed her with close attention, whilst not stopping her flow of conversation, said perhaps the lady would like to come up and see the room, and then things might be arranged. At that point Miss Bly tore herself away with some regret because she had not so far been able to extract all the information she wanted from Tuppence, as to where she came from, what her husband did, how old she was, if she had any children and other matters of interest but it appeared that she had a meeting at her house over which she was going to preside and was terrified at the risk that someone else might seize that coveted post. You'll be quite all right with MRS. Coply, she assured Tuppence, she'll look after you, I'm sure. Now what about your car? Oh, I'll fetch it presently, said Tuppence. MRS. Coply will tell me where I had better put it. I can leave it outside here really because it isn't a very narrow street, is it? Oh, my husband can do better than that for you, said MRS. Coply. He'll put it in the field for you. Just round the side lane here, and it'll be quite all right, there. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.